It's great to have you here as we are journeying through uh, a different type of message in morning together. We're pausing our relationship series and taking time today to look at current events. So many of us have turned on the news this past week, have been scrolling through on, I guess it's not even Twitter, it's X, uh, seeing headlines, asking questions, maybe feeling anxiety about what's happening in the Middle East. And so today we decided to strip away the band to take out all the bells and whistles and instead have a time of teaching. So if you're into history and if you're into Bible study, you're going to really enjoy this morning. Uh, I want to invite you to pull out Bibles or pull out a Bible app so that you can follow along. In fact, you may even want to take notes as we dive into the history behind what's led to what's happening right now in the Middle East. Uh, you can open up your Facebook. You can start taking notes in a post and then just click publish at the end so you don't forget. Um, and then we will have video of this teaching up on our uh, website and on our social media feeds later today, all in an effort to equip you with knowledge to get you into God's word so that God's word gets into you. And if I had to sum up this time of teaching together, if I had to sum it up with just one statement, one big idea, it would be this. The world isn't falling apart. It's falling into place. That's the entire teaching this morning. The world isn't falling apart. It's falling into place. Every headline that we see, every image on the news that's coming out of Israel and Gaza was all foretold 2,600 years ago in scripture. And so if you have a Bible or Bible app, I want to invite you to turn all the way to the beginning, the book of beginnings, Genesis. In Genesis chapter 6, we've uh, already done the story of Adam and Eve, and they're being fruitful and multiplying, and the world gets darker and uglier and more wicked. And so in Genesis 6, we are introduced to a very famous character. Even if you don't go to church, you know who this guy is. It says in Genesis 6, verse 9, that Noah walked with God. So everybody else in the world was wicked and doing their own thing, but Noah alone walked with God, and Noah had three sons. This is important. He had three sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem is where the Jews come from. You've heard of the term Semitic or anti-Semitic. It goes back to Noah's son, Shem. Later, after the flood, after Noah's Ark, in Genesis 9, verse 1, God gives Noah a command. God blessed Noah and his sons. So Shem is one of the three sons. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. So after the destruction of the flood, it's kind of like God took the etch-a-sketch of the world and shook it up and started over from scratch. Noah, Shem, and the other two sons are going to repopulate the earth. So some time goes by, years go by, and it brings us to Genesis chapter 12, where we're introduced to another famous character from the Bible, Abram, who will become Abraham. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, the Lord God said to Abram, he chooses Abram, Abram doesn't choose him, but he chooses Abram, and he says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. <coughs> Abram is on the family tree coming from Shem, the son of Noah. So if you're following the family tree, you've got Noah to Shem. And then from Shem down to Abram. And God chooses Abram out of all the peoples of the earth to make into a great nation that would be blessed, a great name, to be a blessing to the world. 
It's through Abram that we'll eventually get the land of Israel and the Israelites, all tracing back to Shem. You following, connecting the dots? Some of you are saying, whoa, Pastor John, the coffee's just kicking in. Well, buckle up, buttercup, okay? So you've got Abram through his family tree. Eventually will come King David, you know, all of Israel, great people, great name, great family. And then eventually will come Jesus. And you're in church, so Jesus is a big deal around here. So more centuries go by. Uh, all of the people from Israel end up in Egypt. 400 years go by, and they are all enslaved. They're building pyramids. They say, hey, we want out of here. God hears their cries. He raises up a leader, Moses. You've all heard of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Moses is going to lead the people of Israel out of captivity and to the promised land. The 40-year journey, it's kind of like... Uh, if you watch National Lampoon's Vacation and they're in the car, they're trying to get to Wally World, imagine that for 40 years. They drag you crazy. And along the way, Moses is writing books of the Bible. We get to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 31. God is speaking to Moses and to the people. There's like a million of them. And he says, you are to cross over the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So God is giving them a land, but they have to do the work of taking possession of it. And that is a little microcosm of how faith works. Faith is moving forward even though it doesn't make sense. Faith is God goes before you he blesses your steps, but you still have to take the steps forward. And so Moses hands off the baton to Joshua. Joshua leads the people through the Jordan into the land. The book of Joshua is all about wars that they're having. If you like Game of Thrones, you'd love the book of Joshua. You got Judges, which is also a lot of warring, a lot of uh, ups and downs the, of the people of God. And then finally, you have the, the kings. They say, we want to be just like the other countries around us. Give us a king. So they give him King Saul. And then God raises up King David. And then King Solomon. And under King Solomon, the country breaks in two. So it's sort of like we've got one state, the state of Michigan. But you've got Michigan fans and Michigan state fans. It's kind of like a warring faction, right? That happens in Israel. And all during this time, God raises the prophets to speak to the people. And you get to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And it says these words that are very, very interesting for today. God says, I will make Jerusalem, which is the capital of Israel. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. And so all throughout its history, Jerusalem, this tiny sliver of land, in a nation no bigger than New Jersey, has been the epicenter of history. Jerusalem, not Saginaw, not Bay City, not Midland, not New York, not Washington, D.C., not Paris, not Hamburg, Germany. Now, Jerusalem, over and over again in the scriptures, is called this intoxicating drink, this immovable rock, this place that God blesses. God chooses Jerusalem as his own. And it's true not just in biblical history, but in real world history, we see the story of Jerusalem and of Israel intersecting with current events. So let me take you into history. Jesus enters the scene about 2,000, 20 years ago. He lives, he dies on a cross, he rises from the grave, proving that he is God in human flesh, and then he 
ascends into heaven. Before he ascends into heaven, he gives some predictions or what we would call prophecies. And he says that within this lifetime, you're going to see the temple torn apart. To his followers and to anybody out on the outskirts hearing these words, they think that Jesus is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. This temple with its giant Herodian blocks that took all these years to build, it's going to be torn down? Well, it does. In 70 AD, the Romans come into Jerusalem and they destroy everything in their past. The Jewish state had existed in the Middle East with its capital in Jerusalem, but that was destroyed in 70 AD. And this begins the global Jewish diaspora which means all the Jews leave Israel and they are finding places to live all around the globe. During this time, there is a lot of friction in the Holy Lands. There's lots of invasions that happen from different sects. But the one that I want to point out happens in the 600s when the Muslims overtake Jerusalem. They go to the place where Abraham went to to slaughter his son Isaac. Remember that story from Genesis where God says, go and sacrifice your son. And at the last second he says, no, don't do it, don't do it. I just wanted to test you. Well, there's an actual rock there. Some Jewish uh, believers believe that that rock is also where God uh, formed Adam from the earth. So in 691 AD, construction is completed on what is now known as the Dome of the Rock the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was built as a shrine for pilgrims. So for roughly 1,500 years, this Dome of the Rock has stood over the rock, over where the Holy of Holies would have been located with the temple. When you see a picture of Jerusalem today, you recognize the Dome of the Rock. That's important for Muslim identity. They build it there because it's one of the three holy sites of Islam. It is where Muslims believe that their prophet Muhammad uh, was, was raised up on a night's journey on his travels to Mecca. And so they commemorate that as a place for pilgrims to go. That's the Dome of the Rock in 691. All the while, all the Jews have been scattered throughout the earth. And in 1917, the British government issues a declaration. They say, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. So British Palestine is now opening the doors of history to allow the Jewish race back into Israel. At the time, Palestine was predominantly Arab region of the British Empire, and while Jews made up a small portion of the region's population, an increasing number of them were moving there and they were calling on the, the United Kingdom government for support. The reason why they were moving back is because the Jewish faith teaches that Israel belongs to the Jews. And the concept of returning to Israel took on great significance among them. You see this in Ezekiel, in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 8, it says, God says, a long time from now, you will be called into action, talking about other nations. In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war. And then here's the key part. And after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel wrote these words 2,600 years ago. So before Jesus, 600 years before Jesus. And he was prophesying, he was predicting that the Jews would come back to Israel after a long period of being away. Many people thought that that could never happen. But this concept, which is called Zionism, because it's Mount Zion that Jerusalem sits on, Returning to Israel, it was a spiritual idea that would become a very practical idea. In the late 19th century, there's a man named Theodore Herzl. 
Theodore Herzl was an Austro-Hungarian Jew who began arguing that Europe, with its history of anti-Semitic persecution, was no longer safe for Jews. He argued that Jews must form their own state in then British Palestine. So you've got Theodore Herzl, who's becoming a thought leader in this realm. You've got the UK that is starting to change its opinions. And by 1922, Britain and the League of Nations endorsed the idea of a Jewish territory there. So Jewish migrants began traveling to Israel from Europe, and it was a trend that increased when the Nazis and their allies stripped Jews of their citizenship in the 1930s. Between 1922 and 1941, Palestine's Jewish population grew from 84,000 people to nearly half a million. From 1936 to 1939, thousands of Arabs took part in a rebellion that sought to end the British occupation and Jewish immigration into British Palestine. But meanwhile, Jewish militant groups began attacking Arabs and British authorities in Palestine. As that happened, the destruction of European Jews during the Holocaust galvanized support for Israel. So lots of things were happening in the 1930s and the 1940s, and it begins to culminate in November of 1947, when the United Nations adopted a policy that would divide Palestine into two independent states, one Jewish, one Arab, and leave Jerusalem under United Nations control. The Arabs rejected this vision from the UN because they believed the Jews would be given a majority of the land despite comprising a minority of the population. So this plan from the UN led to violence between Arabs and Jews. And when Israel gained its independence, the first Arab-Israeli war was already underway. On May 14, 1948, Israel declared independence. So those words from Ezekiel that were written 2,600 years ago came to fruition. Israel that was lost was now Israel restored. And on that very same time, the next day, Israel was invaded by Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. The Arab army sought to wipe out the nascent Israeli state, but somehow Israel won. And by the end of the war, a majority of Palestinian Arabs had been displaced from their homes. To the Israelis, they had survived an invasion intended to wipe Jews out of the Middle East, a second Holocaust as they saw it. To the Palestinian Arabs, this defeat and displacement became known as the Nahba, or catastrophe. The war left Israel with control of the area that the UN had allocated to it, as well as a chunk of what the Arabs were supposed to own. So Jordan occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank. Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip, and none of the Arab states signed peace treaties or recognized Israel's right to exist. Then, in 1967, Syria began shelling Israel and Egyptian troops that were massed on Egypt's border. And believing an invasion was imminent, Israel launched a preemptive attack that was known as the Six Days War. They routed those countries' armies. They took control of Jerusalem, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Sinai Peninsula. Palestinians in these newly seized territories came under Israeli military occupation. You still tracking with me? Lots of tension in the Middle East. During this time, Palestinian militants organized into groups like the Palestine Liberation Organization, or the PLO, which conducted attacks around the world. Those shootings included bombings, hijackings, and the murder of 11 Israelis at the Munich Olympics in the 1970s. 
1973, Egypt and Syria launched a surprise invasion of Israel on the Yom Kippur holiday. That was 50 years ago. The Yom Kippur War ended in an Israeli victory, but it shocked the country, which had fared worse than expected and suffered relatively heavy losses. Peace negotiations began in earnest after the 1973 war. Israel pursued a land for peace strategy, offering the land it had conquered in 1973 in exchange for peace treaties with its neighbors. That finally bore fruit in 1979, when Egypt became the first Arab country to sign a peace deal with Israel. As part of the deal, Egypt recognized Israel's right to exist, and Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula. Yet no other land for peace deals materialized among other Palestinian groups. Neither side was willing to compromise over Jerusalem, which Israel had made its capital. Israelis had also begun moving into the Palestinian territories. And many Palestinian groups, including the PLO, continued to call for Israel's destruction. Finally, in 1993, after many years of secret negotiations and talks, Yasser Arafat, the leader of the PLO, shook hands with Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. The handshake marked the signing of the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords basically meant that Israel agreed to gradually withdraw its troops from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And in response, the PLO recognized Israel's right to exist and renounced violence against Israel. The agreement was hailed as the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and Arafat and Rabin both won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1994 for their roles in this. Yet, much of what was agreed upon never came to fruition, and other issues, such as the fate of Jerusalem, which both sides were claiming as their capital, it all remained unresolved. In 1995, a hardline Israeli assassinated Yitzhak Rabin, and soon after, a wave of Palestinian terrorism struck Israel. Between 2000 and 2005, discontent caused in part by the failure of the Oslo Accords led to a Palestinian uprising, during which over 2,000 Israelis and 5,000 Palestinians died. Amid that, Israel built a wall around the West Bank and withdrew its troops from Gaza. That withdrawal was completed in 2005. The Oslo Accords caused a schism among the Palestinians. Many felt it made life more difficult by requiring them to pass through checkpoints, apply for work permits, and live in certain prescribed areas. Many Palestinians accused Arafat's ruling Fatah party of selling out the Palestinian cause. And so amid growing discontent, a rival Palestinian group arose called Hamas. And Hamas began growing in popularity. Unlike Fatah, which was Yasser Arafat's group, Hamas wanted to create an Islamic state it never recognized Israel's right to exist. It opposed the Oslo Accords, which it called a sellout deal, and Hamas's charter explicitly calls for Israel's destruction. In 2006, the Palestinian territories held elections to determine which of these two parties would rule, would prevail, and the outcome would change the course of Palestinian history. Between Fatah and Hamas, Hamas, the hardline group, won 44% of the vote, the most of any party, allowing it to form a new government. Israel, the United States, the European Union, and other countries that consider Hamas a terrorist group opposed this victory. They sanctioned pro-Hamas politicians 
They worked with Fatah, its more moderate Palestinian rival, to undermine Hamas's power. 2007, tensions between Hamas and Fatah boiled over into a civil war. And by the time all the violence ended, Hamas controlled the Gaza Strip, Fatah controlled the West Bank. Gaza hasn't held any elections since then, and Hamas remains in power to this day. As Hamas has consolidated control in the Gaza Strip, Israel and Egypt imposed a blockade on the territory, which they said was to prevent Hamas from importing weapons. This blockade still exists, and it's rendered the Gaza Strip almost entirely dependent on Israel for electricity, fuel, food, goods, anything they need, it has to come from Israel. In the midst of all this, if you're still tracking with me, Iran has become Hamas's main sponsor, supplying it with weapons and teaching it to build its own weapons. Hamas uses these weapons often rockets to attack Israel. It's also dug elaborate tunnels all underneath the Gaza Strip to move undetected, to enter into Israel and to smuggle goods. There's been many skirmishes since Hamas took power. In 2009, there was an Israeli invasion of the Gaza Strip that lasted 16 days. It resulted in 1,400 Palestinians' deaths and 13 Israeli deaths. Israel's strategy is to respond to Hamas's attacks with disproportionate strength intended to wipe out Hamas's infrastructure and deter future attacks. The wars, the blockade, the sanctions, the corruption have made Gaza, which is twice the size of Washington, D.C., one of the world's poorest places. With its people typically unable to leave, many have likened it to an open-air prison. Israel says Hamas gives it no choice but to blockade the Strip. Some blame the Strip's plight on Hamas, which has refused to compromise and eliminated the more modern opposition. Others blame Israel, arguing that Hamas's radicalism is a function of living under a blockade. So for years and years, the blame has gotten passed around between Hamas and Israel, and little has changed until last Saturday, which if you've watched the news, over 1,300 Israelis were killed in a coordinated surprise attack by Hamas. That would be, if it were, that were to happen in the United States, that would be equal to 30,000 or 40,000 Americans being slaughtered in one day. Many have likened last Saturday to being Israel's 9-11. And now there is war in the Middle East, war that could easily spread and become even more divisive. All of that history helps us understand what the geopolitical situation is. But more astonishing is that the Bible predicted all of these events and predicts more when it comes to the end times. And even if you are part of church world, everyone's imagination is always captured when we talk about prophecy and the end times. 2,600 years ago, a book was written called Ezekiel. He was a great prophet in Israel. And in Ezekiel chapter 37, it says these words that are pertinent to today's situation. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, Ezekiel, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, your horses, your horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host. All of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them. Scholars will tell you that Magog is modern-day Russia. 
And all throughout scripture, Persia refers to modern day Iran. What is happening right now in the Middle East is something that was foretold many years ago and that may happen in our lifetime, it may not happen in our lifetime. But this is to show you that the world is not falling apart, it's really falling into place as God foretold. In the scripture it says that hooks will be put into the jaws of Magog, drawing them into a conflict with Israel. So something happens according to Ezekiel that draws Russia south into Israel reluctantly and that they are connected somehow to Persia, which is Iran. Iran is the main sponsor of Hamas. Hamas is the terrorist organization that attacked Israel last week, that Israel's declared war against. Now, I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of a prophet, I work for a nonprofit organization. But if you were to wake up tomorrow and see the headline that Iran attacks Israel, in support of Hamas. Don't be surprised then if Iran's ally, Russia, gets pulled in reluctantly, which would fulfill Ezekiel 37. Again, I'm not saying this is going to happen right now, but it will happen someday in the future. And it feels like all the pieces are getting put into place. And if not now, for a future event that is similar. The scripture goes on in Ezekiel 37 and says these words, but on that day, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be roused in my anger. For in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath, I declare on that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So Hamas is the tapped Israel. Hamas is being given weapons and supplies from Iran. Iran is in a strategic alliance with Russia right now. They are providing drones to Russia so that Russia uses those drones to uh, attack in their war that they're having right now with, uh, with the, Europe, the European country. If Russia gets pulled in, if Iran gets pulled in, which many uh, analysts are worried about in the news right now, you could see the words of Ezekiel 37 come to life, which will lead to a great earthquake, which then sets into motion many of the prophecies from the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. In 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and Revelation, it's hinted or intimated that around that time, the believers will be caught up in the air. What's called a rapture. I don't understand it. I don't know how that works, but it says that at that time, Jesus will be returning. And when you look at the holy books of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, all three are looking ahead to when the Messiah will return. These are all pieces of the puzzle that point to when the Messiah will return, leading to the end times. So what are the takeaways from this, this big history lesson we just went through, from all these pieces of biblical prophecy? What are the takeaways? There's four takeaways, four ideas you can write down, okay? First takeaway is this, scripture is true. The Bible is true. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching. That's what we've been doing today is teaching. It's profitable for reproof and for training in righteousness. People said for centuries that Israel could never come back together. And then in 1947, 1948, it happens. Scripture is true. Number two, God is is in control of history. God is sovereign, he is king, he rules over all of history. 
In Ezekiel 37, 23, it says, I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. When the world seems out of control, God is in control. In your own life, when you feel anxiety, when you feel stress, when you feel like life is over your head, it is still under his feet. Knowing that God is in control gives you reassurance. It should help you sleep better at night. You can rest knowing that his eyes never slumber. The third thing this tells us, buckle up and look up. What did Jesus tell his followers about the end times? Did he say, freak out, pull your hair out, lose your mind? No. In Matthew 24, verses six through eight, this is what Jesus said about the end times. He said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. Be not afraid. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. What we're seeing in the news is the beginning of the birth pains, but be not alarmed. God is in control. I've read the ending. I know, I know how it ends. We win. We're okay. But here's the fourth and final takeaway that we should get from what's happening in the world. That we have an imperative. We have a mission. We have a passion to reach the lost at any cost. To reach as many people as we can to help make heaven crowded. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus says, your job is not to freak out about the headlines on the news. He says, be aware of what's happening. Buckle up, look up, and reach out. Do whatever it takes to reach more people with God's love, God's message of inclusiveness, where everyone's welcome, nobody is perfect. And that's why this church exists. The reason we stepped out in faith 10 years ago to start a church from scratch was to reach people just like you and just like me, people who don't have it all together, knowing that history is moving forward. Eventually, time will run out. Jesus will return, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Right now, our job is to fill up heaven with as many people as possible by sharing God's message of love and forgiveness. Because the world isn't falling apart, it's falling into place. Let me pray with you all. Lord God, we first thank you for this space to meet in today, to gather, to worship you, to sit under this teaching from the scriptures, knowing that you are the Lord of history. You foretold, you prophesied in pages past about the reality we now experience. And so Lord, help that to develop our faith. Help that to strengthen our ties to you, to know that you're in control, even when life feels like it's out of control. Lord, we pray for the complexity of the situation in Israel and Gaza today, where many people are hurting, families are suffering, Individuals are strategizing, and yet you are Lord of all. God, would you bring peace? Would you bring understanding to the situation? Would you give great wisdom to leaders? 
Lord, would you help us to trust you more in the days ahead with the scriptures as our guide. Give us a passion. Give us a raw energy, Lord, led by your spirit to reach our region for Christ. Knowing that the pages of history that were written, that are yet to be fulfilled, are still on their way. And that our role, Lord, is to trust you and to press forward. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.